Hi, I'm Pastor Steve Talmadge of Love of Christ Lutheran Church in Mesa, Arizona. Each week, Pastor Nanette Christofferson or I try to provide a brief introduction to two of the assigned Bible readings for the upcoming Sunday. We're going to look at Genesis 50, verses 15 to 21. This is uh, for Sunday, September 17th, 2023. This is a classic story, uh, and I encourage you to spend time uh, in the events leading up to uh, this uh, chapter 50. Uh, and maybe begin back in, in chapter 36 even and work your way through it. But this is a classic story of how families are messy. Uh, it's one of the most powerful stories in the Hebrew Scriptures, and it's a reminder to not lose hope. And trust that God can and does work for good, even when it appears that evil has the upper hand. The story of Joseph and his brothers is a reminder of dysfunctional families uh, is not unique to our day. But it goes all the way back to Genesis. And so we're talking here about um, 3,800 years ago. And you see family dynamics at work. The story raises up the question of how God will be found faithful. And now the promise God made way back in Genesis 12 to Abraham and Sarah, that through them a great nation would come that would receive God's abundant blessing to be a blessing to the world. God chooses to use people to carry out God's uh, will. And uh, sometimes there's detours and twists and uh, there's moments of lamentation and despair. But through it all, God is still able to work through us. Background to this story, Genesis 37 Jacob and Israel had settled in the land of Canaan, which will become Palestine, Israel. Uh, Jacob has two wives and two concubines, and out of those relationships come 12 sons. Joseph and his younger brother Benjamin are born to the favorite of uh, Jacob, uh, Rachel, who has recently died. Joseph reveals he has a gift at a young age for interpreting dreams. And his father shows favoritism to Joseph, which again, uh, is a problem in any family where there's more than one child. Uh, uh, Jacob gives uh, Joseph a coat of many colors, and you can only imagine he's number 11 of 12 boys, how he might flaunt that gift. And he's also uh, the oldest of Joseph's, uh, Jacob's favorite wife. Uh, in sharing uh, his interpretation of two dreams, he makes it very clear that of the 12 sons of Jacob, uh, he is going to be in a position above his siblings, uh, which as we get to chapter 50, we'll see come true. Well, typical brothers, how do they feel about this runt brother of theirs, this little brother of theirs, uh, acting like he's so special? Uh, he becomes jealous, irritated, and they plot and they sell him off to slave traders to take him away from them. But then they go back to Jacob, their father, and lie that he's been torn apart by wild beasts. And he brings uh, his favorite coat all torn up, covered with uh, some animal blood. Uh, in the process of being sold to slave traders, Joseph travels to Egypt and finds himself uh, in the home of Potiphar, a captain of the guard in Pharaoh's army, uh, an elite officer of the Pharaoh. Uh, and here uh, now Joseph, a young boy, uh, is uh, in place of uh, being a house servant to this uh, this uh, leader. In Genesis 38, uh, we have a kind of side commentary of this drama, but it, it has a, a statement that Jacob's sons begin to take wives outside of the family. This is going to be a problem. Uh, it may lead to uh, the line of David being threatened. And then we see this function continue just in this chapter where Judah, one of the sons of Jacob, uh, his wife has died. His daughter-in-law, Tamer, uh, is uh, hiding her face by veil, and uh, Judah ends up uh, having sex with her. And, uh, and she's being labeled as a prostitute, as a whore. And she's wise enough to know she, how vulnerable she is that uh, in the course of their engagement encounter, uh, she takes uh, some items of Judah. Uh, some uh, totems that he carries around, kind of like uh, lucky charms that he has. And when he's and when Tamer is brought before her father-in-law for a disgraceful behavior, she reveals, "Well, you're the one, in fact, that's had sex with me." And so he allows her to live, and the line of David is going to be spared. Um, Genesis 39. 
we return to Joseph. Joseph's in the home of Potiphar, uh, and we see in verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. And this phrase is lifted up through the whole Joseph narrative, but the path to success is anything but straight or smooth. The Lord was with Joseph, just like God promises to be with all of us. And we can become faithful and successful, but that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Uh, Joseph, in this drama, gets falsely accused by Potiphar's wife of raping her, when in fact she is the one that tried to seduce him, and he refused her because he knew whose wife she was, and he knew that uh, the leader of this army is not going to uh, put, uh, put up with this behavior. Well, she's scorned, and a scorned woman is a dangerous woman, and so her accusations fall against this uh, slave and uh, he gets put in jail and of course he gets thrown in jail and because of the gifts and and the skills that he has he's placed in charge of running the prison verse 23 the chief jailer paid no no heed to anything that was in joseph's care because the lord was with him and whatever he did the lord made it prosper again the lord was with him and joseph uses the gifts that god has given him to uh, earn a reputation and some benefits. Uh, Genesis 40 to 41, Joseph uses his skills for interpreting two prisoners' dreams who are part of uh, Pharaoh's court, a uh, baker and a butler, and, uh, and which then leads to Pharaoh call upon his services because Pharaoh's having these dreams and he has none of his wise uh, sage people able to interpret. And the report is that you have a guy in prison that knows how to interpret dreams. So he comes out. And the dreams were seven healthy cows and seven sickly cows, seven bountiful ears of corn and seven blighted ears of corn. Well, Joseph uh, is able to interpret that we're going to have seven years of bounty, abundance in livestock and crops. And you better prepare because there are going to be seven years of horrible famine. Because of this interpretation, Joseph is placed as second to Pharaoh. Second in the most popular, powerful uh, uh, nation of the time, Egypt, and he's placed second in charge of overseeing this feeding program. Genesis 42, famine leads the sons of Jacob to seek food in Egypt and have to ask Joseph for help. So remember the dreams in Genesis 37 of brothers bowing down to him? This is the irony, and, and this is kind of a wicked sense of humor here uh, of how the tables get turned. There's no food in Canaan. There's food in Egypt because of the management and interpretation of Joseph. And so the brothers are sent to their younger brother who they sold away into slavery, who's been in prison and brought out of prison, uh, and now uh, they're needing his help. And so the drama is, what's he going to do? 42 to 45, there's some give and take on helping the family, and I encourage you to, to read these chapters because there is some game playing going on. Uh, but the brothers don't recognize Joseph. He is adopted and absorbed and assimilated in the full Egyptian culture. He's dressed like an Egyptian. He talks like an Egyptian. He looks like an Egyptian. And they think his bro their brother may be dead or somewhere else. They could never imagine their brother being Pharaoh's second in charge. In 45, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. Their first thought was that he would seek vengeance, verse 5. And now, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life and to preserve for you a remnant on earth. Joseph, through his relationship with God, is able to see God has been at work through this whole drama. From the horrible things that his brothers did to what happened to him in Potiphar's house, to his time in prison, to now his position of responsibility in Egypt. He sees that God is going to use him to spare his family and spare the promise made to Abraham and Sarah, the promise made uh, to his father Jacob. Genesis 46 to 49, all of Jacob, uh, of Jacob Israel's family moved to Goshen. So look at this map and look at the, where the arrow points to ancient Goshen. Look at the contrast in the uh, topography. You see uh, the Nile River flowing north into the Mediterranean Sea, and you see green. 
And as you follow the Nile Valley, you see green. But beyond that, what do you see? Dirt. Dirt. Desert. Uh, uh, scarcity. So in the irony, again, of God providing for Israel, uh, they move into the most uh, lush, uh, lush, uh, abundant area in the nation of Israel. Uh, they survive the famine. Jacob dies there, but his bones are returned to Hebron, which is uh, south of Jerusalem and uh, in a very contentious area of the West Bank now uh, because we have the tomb of the patriarchs there and we have a, we have a mosque and, and a synagogue in that area. And there's been a lot of uh, violence and a lot of military presence there currently. Uh, but, but, the, but Jacob is placed with his grandfather and his father, Abraham and Isaac. Their bones are still there. You can go visit them today. We get to our lesson, uh, Genesis 50. The grief of Joseph is over. His father's death is described in his burial. And then uh, we have this whole act of forgiveness. Realizing, I'm going to read the text, realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brother said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? They realized that, that dad being alive was a source of protection, a shield of coverage. Now he's gone. Is Joseph going to you know, get even? Is he going to do an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth? So they approached Joseph saying, your father gave this instruction before he died. They have a scheme. Again, these are scheming brothers to lie to protect themselves. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of God of your father. Joseph hears this and he hears them saying that their father was afraid that he wouldn't take care of his family. So Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, we are here as your slaves. They recognized the guilt that they've been carrying all these years. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. This is an act of grace, an act of mercy, an act of forgiveness. You know, Joseph could have spent 20 years in jail thinking about getting even with his brothers for what they've done to him. But what does he do? He graces them and he assures them. And he supports them. And he understands that God is at work in, in even the most horrific plans that people carry out and do. God is still able to work good. So I ask, what is it that drives people not to believe they are really forgiven? Or that those who have been wrong will only want vengeance? God bless you as you read this story and ponder it and think about it as you prepare for worship. Take care.